I remember we had a bit of problem last year. Thanks, Lotsi. Okay, let me okay, share this sound. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Are you, are you recording? Have you started recording? Yeah. Okay. Okay, let me go from the beginning. Okay, so hello everyone. So as Latsi said, I'm a forest ecologist. So my talk today will be about um, forest biodiversity, why it's important to study it, and also about the methods what we can use to uh, study forest biodiversity. So why uh, forests, why, why forests are important? Um, forests are, uh, they're covering quite a lot of land area on Earth, about one third, about 31%. So there are forests, um, big uh, sort of boreal uh, forest zone uh, in the north latitudes um, in Canada and North Europe and Russia. And then there is also big area of tropical forests near equator. Uh, in uh, South America and Africa and parts of Asia. And then there is also temperate forest zone where we are in United Kingdom and um, uh, in that sort of latitudes. So forests cover quite a lot of land. Uh, they also host most of Earth's terrestrial biodiversity. So there are about 60,000 described tree species, maybe there are many more, but we don't know yet, uh, and not maybe, but for sure, because every year new species of trees are described, particularly in the tropics. Um, forests uh, harbor about 80% of all species of amphibi amphibians. 70% um, of all known bird species live in forests, and 70% uh, 68% uh, of all mammal species live in forests as well. So forests are very important habitats for uh, all kind of groups of uh, organisms. And uh, from sort of human angle, 
forests provide a lot of uh, benefits, uh, what we often refer to as ecosystem services. So the benefits what humans derive from particular um, habitats. So some of these are so-called provisioning services. Um, uh, and in case of forests, obviously the unique um, thing what they provide is wood and fiber, so timber. Uh, but forests are also important in providing water uh, and fuel and also a lot of other uh, edible uh, products from forests such as berries and mushrooms which are important in many countries as well as uh, sort of game animals. Um, also uh, there are supporting services so forests are important in um, maintaining and forming the soils, uh, which are obviously crucial for growing all sort of plants. Uh, they are very important in the process of primary production, which is basically productivity by plants, um, providing habitat for many different species, as I already said, recycling different nutrients. Forests are very important for regulation of climate. They are very important carbon sink. They take a lot of carbon dioxide from the uh, atmosphere, and by doing that, they reduce the levels of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. They are also very important in regulation of floods because trees take a lot of water with their roots from soil. And in areas which are forested, the floods are happening much less than in areas which are devoid of trees. And they are also very important for water purification. And then, of course, forests deliver also what we know as sort of cultural services. So forests are very important areas for recreation, especially during the last few years when we had COVID, uh, we kind of got a new new appreciation of the uh, nice sites around where we live, where we can walk. Um, um, and often there are sites which have parks or uh, forests which have some trees in them. Um, forests also have spiritual value, um, aesthetic value, and also important for education as well. Um, so uh, forests are important. Uh, how much forest we actually have in Europe? Uh, it really varies by country. So you can see on this map, uh, the darker green color indicates uh, higher forest cover uh, and the lighter cover color indicates lower forest cover. So there are some countries in Europe like Sweden and Finland, which are very well forested. They have about 70% of forest cover. On average in Europe, it's about 30%. Uh, and UK actually is one of the least forested countries in Europe, 13% um, only. And that's the result of reduction in forest cover over the last few thousand years. It used to be much uh, more forested, but uh, due to the uh, clearance of land for agriculture uh, by the uh, First World War, uh, beginning of 20th century, forest cover in UK was only about 5%. So the fact that it's now 13 uh, represents a big improvement achieved during the last 100 years or so. And it has been achieved by uh, largely efforts of Forestry Commission, which is the government uh, and, uh, department in UK, which is responsible for delivering timber, uh, but also delivering and managing the woodlands for other purposes as well. And um, when Forestry Commission was created after the First World War, then the government recognized what 5% of forest cover is not sufficient and forest and timber is needed. Um, for uh, all kind of things during the war and it cannot be imported from outside during the war. Uh, so the Forestry Commission was tasked with uh, providing timber stock 
and um, uh, people working in forestry commission recognized what our native tree species in UK, oaks, uh, beech uh, trees and so on, they grow quite slowly. Um, and um, in order to get tree species which would produce timber much quicker, they started to introduce in UK conifer species from uh, largely from North America. Sitka spruce, for instance, which is a species originally from Alaska. And so these conifer plantations were planted, especially in the north of the country, on very large scale. They looked uh, very artificial, not like uh, natural forest. You can see on this photo the trees are planted in rows um, in a very regular fashion. And uh, obviously diversity in this kind of plantation is very low because there is only one tree species planted. And this has been done um, not just in UK, but across Europe as well. Lots of these plantations have been established. Um, so a lot of um, forests in Europe and uh, in the rest of the world nowadays are converted from this kind of natural mixed species stance to plantations dominated by a single tree species, which is considered to be most beneficial in terms of timber production for a particular climate or particular country. So the question is how this transition affects um, biodiversity um, uh, within forests and how it affects um, the functioning of forest ecosystems and all these ecosystem services on which we as humans but also other organisms so critically depend. So you can think about a forest as a quite complex system like an airplane. So forests are complex ecosystems which are composed of many species just like airplane is composed of many rivets. And then you can think what obviously the main function of a plane is to fly. And so for plane to function, it needs these rivets. And if a plane starts losing individual rivets, uh, various things might happen. Eventually it will lead to catastrophe, but uh, perhaps initially losing just a few rivets, just like for forest ecosystems, losing just a few species, maybe will not result in drastic reduction in uh, functioning of this ecosystem because uh, these few species or these rivets might happen to be functionally redundant. That means what they play the same functional role. So for instance, there are quite many rivets which hold together the wing of the plane, preventing it from collapsing. So if you lose one or two rivets, other rivets will still hold the wing in place. So if we lose some species from forest ecosystems, maybe initially there is no big change in ability of this ecosystem to function and deliver ecosystem services, but then we will reach the threshold beyond which there are no more rivets which can hold or perform this particular process, and we will see dramatic decrease in ecosystem functioning. In other situations for other processes, uh, each species plays particular roles, so we can see this kind of proportional change as we lose more species, the uh, functioning of the uh, this ecosystem will change proportionally, diminish. Or in sometimes, if we lose species which are particularly important for ecosystem functioning, so-called keystone species, we might very rapidly uh, lose uh, the ability of this ecosystem to perform this function or crash of a plane. So this is what I'm kind of studying, uh, basically how changes in forest diversity, reduction in tree species diversity, reduction in uh, tree genetic diversity affects uh, various ecosystem functions. And um, in order to do that, you need to be able to measure forest biodiversity. So you need to be able to monitor how it's changing depending on different um, management regimes, depend over time, over space and so on. So we have in ecology a lot of traditional ecological uh, field survey methods 
um, which we use to look at diversity of different groups of organisms. So here is Prince Charles demonstrating how to use uh, entomological net, a very common piece of equipment used by uh, insect ecologists when they want to sample insects from uh, some vegetation. Um, or here are actually students from Royal Holloway from a few years ago on practical field ecology course, what I teach together with my colleague Becky Thomas. And we have been installing uh, life traps uh, for small mammals. So they are examining the catch uh, little voles and mice um, on campus and identifying them to species. Um, another very common way to survey the habitats, both um, plants as well as sur doing surveys in habitats such as um, um, literal, uh, is uh, using quadrats where you can put the quadrat of a certain area on the ground and quantify and identify the species which occur in that area. You can also do point surveys on transects. So here uh, a person is walking a particular route and stopping at certain points, uh, recording the bird species, what he or she can see uh, and identify in a particular points over time. Uh, but all of these traditional ecological field surveys have some uh, sort of uh, drawbacks. One problem is what in order to identify species using all of these surveys, you need to have good taxonomic expertise. So if you're doing uh, sweep netting, you will need to be able to identify all the insects what you trap. Um, if you are doing uh, point surveys birding, you need to be able to identify all the bird species. And there are relatively few experts in uh, able to identify particular groups of organisms. For some groups, there are more experts. For some, there are fewer. So if you want to do biodiversity surveys of many different groups of organisms, potentially you need quite a lot of experts able to identify all the groups you're interested in. Um, some of these sampling methods require uh, trapping the organisms, sometimes it's live trapping, so you can release the organisms back in the wild. But for some, like pitfall trapping for insects, for instance, you uh, kill the insects by doing that. So it's destructive sampling, which of course you don't want perhaps to conduct in the habitats which you know already have been threatened, uh, where biodiversity is already in severe decline and you don't want to do this sampling very regularly because the more you sample, the more organisms you will kill and um, you might completely destroy population of some rare species. Um, to look at how biodiversity is changing as a result of our uh, various ways to manage habitats, we need to monitor it more or less continuously over time uh, but doing it continuously is very uh, difficult and expensive if you need to do these surveys on the ground and identify all the species. Um, it, it's really uh, almost impossible in many situations. And also many species, it's very difficult to observe directly. Species which live in soil, for instance, species which are active during the night, where you can't see properly, even if you're able to do surveys at night. Um, and presence of humans while doing the surveys might change the behavior of a species. So you see here this meerkat sitting on the back of the uh, person taking photos. So if we want to learn about natural behavior of a species, um, where they occur, how they behave, which habitats they prefer, uh, presence of humans might affect these results of surveys. So one way uh, during the last few decades, ecologists have been monitoring biodiversity 
uh, is uh, by camera traps. And you probably all familiar with camera traps. They are now very commonly used in TV programs like, you know, Winter Watch, Autumn Watch, um, uh, Spring Watch, and so on. Uh, and you, you know, maybe you have some what you own. People like putting them in in, in their own gardens. Uh, if you have a family of foxes there, or if you have a bird feeder, you might want to watch um, the recordings of different species visiting your garden. Uh, you can buy these cameras, uh, or you can do them yourself. Uh, this is a DIY camera. Uh, made by one of the students at our practical field ecology uh, a few years ago. She 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 built it herself. She just uh, bought bits and pieces for it and assembled it and uh, was successful in recording the uh, birds in her uh, bird feeder in the garden for her project. Uh, so the advantages of using camera traps for monitoring biodiversity is what they are not destructive. They just take a photo or video. They will not kill or trap the, the animal. Um, they can uh, last for a long time. You can change the battery and then just leave them in the wild for weeks or months, depending on how often you want the photos to be taken. Um, uh, they because you are not present there in a forest, so you can record uh, undisturbed behavior of organisms. Um, so the species will not be disturbed by the presence of humans and they will be uh, behaving in a natural way. Um, you can also collect a lot of additional information using camera traps. So it's not just um, uh, presence or absence of a species or which species it is, but you can look, uh, sometimes you're able to identify individuals of that species based on the uh, particular coloring. You can tell about the size of these organisms or uh, how, uh, what's the condition of them based on how they look, whether they look like they had a uh, been feeding well or whether they look sick. You can look for some signs of uh, various diseases. Um, you can use camera traps uh, to record nocturnal species. They can take uh, pictures in infrared light. Um, and a good thing about camera traps is what they provide permanent and verifiable data. So you can store these images. And if you yourself not sure what species it is, you can show it to experts. You can get extra opinion uh, uh, of, from people who can identify this species. And you can actually verify the records. And it also means what this is a repeatable method. So you can use this camera repeatedly in the same um, places and uh, hopefully get a similar similar results. Um, so what kind of data can you generate uh, by using camera traps? So you can get data on occupancy. So if this is the area what you are surveying with camera traps and you install the number of traps in that area, um, each of the camera will be recording and you might be interested, say, in um, two different mammal species. And you will have records of uh, camera traps recording this species in particular parts of the habitat. So you can see what, in this case, uh, this orangutan seem to be uh, occupying uh, areas here. Uh, it's not seen in other parts of this land, but only in this part while this uh, rhinoceros is present uh, over here, but not in that part. So that's already an important information in which part of the habitat the organisms live. If you're able to identify individuals, so you're not only able to say this is a rangutan, but you are able to identify um, the specimens, um, uh, because of the different size, different uh, coloration, and so on, then you might be able also to get data on relative abundance. So you might uh, get uh, data on number of individuals, what you see um, in particular parts of the territory. Uh, 
Um, you can also get data on species richness, how many different species are recorded in different parts of the habitat. And that's important because if, for instance, you're doing this uh, biodiversity monitoring to establish which part of the habitat is more species rich and therefore uh, would be suitable for creating some sort of protection area, and then it makes sense, obviously, to create this protection area in the part of the habitat which has higher diversity. And also it will tell you something about the activity patterns because each video or each photo will be taken um, by, uh, uh, it will be recorded at a particular time. So you will have a record when during the day at what time this uh, photo was taken. And from that data, you will be able to get an idea about uh, activity patterns of different animals. Um, so here's just one example of use of uh, camera traps. This is my PhD student, Joelle Lidl. She just uh, a month ago, she finally submitted her thesis. Uh, she's from Guyana. This is Guyana in South America. And Joelle, uh, uh, her PhD was funded by WWF. And she was uh, looking at uh, recovery of tropical forests after abandonment of gold mines. So in Guyana, uh, there is a lot of artisan companies which are digging for gold. And to do that, they get permit from the government and then they cut the forest. Uh, they create this massive pit. Um, they search for gold. Um, they um, work there for maybe a few years and then they exhaust the gold reserves in that particular location and then they leave. Uh, often without even covering this pit. Um, and gradually, of course, the forest will uh, come back. Uh, but the question is um, how quickly, whether uh, the composition of this forest and forest diversity is very different from undisturbed one. So what Joel has done, she selected a lot of uh, sites uh, which used to be gold mines but have been abandoned at different uh, times installed uh, cameras there and recorded different bird and mammal species um, and also look at changes in vegetation uh, from the center of the mine to the sort of areas of indisturbed forest around. And um, uh, here are some examples of the uh, species what she trapped. Uh, okay, so here is um, a little bit of a quiz. Um, hopefully Lazi can check the chat uh, for me for answers. So I'm going to show you a few photographs uh, uh, from camera traps, starting with a few photos from camera traps installed at the Royal Holloway campus. So this one was provided by Dr. Steve Portugal from our department. Could you guess what two animals are featured here? This was taken at night, so it's in black and white. I am looking, Julia. Thank you. Yeah, I can't um, look at the chat at the same time. Badges. Badges, yes, well done. Yeah, badges. So we have apparently several badger sets on campus and badgers, as you probably know, are nocturnal animals, so they are active at night. Here is another one uh, from our campus. This is a, not a badger, but somebody, this is actually on a badger set. You can see that there is a hole in the ground, so there is a badger living below ground, but who is this animal here? That was during the day, this photograph. That was taken last winter. Any guesses? Deer. Very good. Yeah, not, not just deer, but manjak deer. Yeah. So this is a non-native deer from Asia, which has been introduced in UK, I think in 1920s, something like that. And it's now almost becoming our most common deer species in the UK. Uh, lots of them on campus uh, for all Holloway. Okay, let's try some birds. Uh, so this is from Royal Holloway Arboretum. 
uh, our collection of trees just across A30 from the main campus. And we have a little bit blurred, but recognizable bird here, green one with red color on the head. Green woodpecker, excellent, very good. Uh, lovely bird, uh, yeah. It's taken by, the, these cameras were installed by a uh, master student, uh, Sam Thompson, uh, master student with Steve Portugal. And another bird, about the same size, size as the woodpecker, but different color. Maybe this blue color on the wings will help to identify it. Sorry, what? Ah, that's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Anybody? <laughs> we we have something similar for practical field ecology exam when we show photos or yeah. So anybody recognize that one? No. Okay, so this is J. Uh, J, which is, a, yeah, ah, it was said, good, yeah, so it's a member of crow family, but not black or black and white as crows and magpies, but more colorful, very important in spreading acorns um, and planting little oaks. Uh, okay, now I will show a few photos from further away. Uh, this is just to show you what often um, this camera, uh, this uh, camera traps, they, the, the, the photos are triggered by the movement of the animal, by the, uh, they have this infrared sensor so they can sense uh, large warm-blooded organisms moving nearby, uh, but sometimes they don't capture the picture of the whole animal, so you have to take a guess. So I'll show you some uh, partial <laughs> pictures from uh, a project in Africa. Uh, so this is from Leopard Research Program. So can you recognize this African animal from a bit of a leg? <laughs> Giraffe, yeah, very large animal. So presumably this camera trap was installed close to the ground. So maybe not meant to um, capture the, probably for leopards, but not to capture this massive animal. Here is another one. This one was obviously at night, a bit blurry. Yeah. <laughs> Porcupine, very good. Yeah, you can see the, uh, the, the needles, long needles, yeah. And the last one. Uh, no, a bit smaller one, <laughs> a bit smaller creature. This is a wart, yeah, warthog, yeah, yeah, it's a type of uh, wild boar, um, African wild boar, yeah, yeah. Okay, good, so even as you can see, even if they are partial figures, uh, pictures, you, you can recognize species. But, yeah. Oh, great, well done. Well done, uh, well done. There will be another quiz with sounds, so we'll see how it goes, maybe. Somebody else will, <laughs> will be good in, in voices. Good, okay, so, so camera traps can provide lots of useful information, but uh, they not always very good in performing in environments which are very humid or very hot, they might malfunction. Um, one of the biggest problems working with camera traps is what, uh, if you use them to record biodiversity, uh, they only uh, capture limited uh, sort of subsets of organisms because as i said they capture motion of uh infrared infrared 
sort of motion uh, sensors capture movement of r medium to large warm-bodied terrestrial animals so largely mammals or big birds uh, but you can't use really camera traps to monitor uh, amphibians for instance uh, or some small small birds unless you put them inside the nest box or something like that so they don't they, they don't give you the picture of the whole biodiversity and then, of course, camera traps, uh, they are quite obvious when you put them on uh, trees, even if you camouflage them. So they can be stolen or vandalized by humans if you put them in places where humans are, but also they can be damaged by uh, wildlife uh, themselves. And um, one challenge uh, is what they produce lots and lots of uh, image and video data. So if you leave these cameras for several weeks or months and then come back and collect this data and you have many cameras to go through footage, uh, this is quite a task because uh, a lot of photos will be of quality, but you cannot really recognize anything. So it takes a lot of time to get through this footage. Another method of monitoring biodiversity, which became very um, popular more recently, is acoustic monitoring. So monitoring, recording the sounds, not the images of animals, but the sounds what they make. And um, the uh, as as everything in technology, the size of the um, acoustic uh, recorders decreased with time, starting with quite big devices. And this is Audiomorph, one of the most popular ones nowadays and the cheapest ones. And they are more or less the size of a credit card. So they are really small and um, not that obvious when you put them on a branch of a tree. So what are the advantages of this acoustic monitoring? Well, similarly to camera traps, they are non-invasive and non-destructive so they just record the sounds they don't disturb the animals you don't have to be present there when they are recording they allow for long-term monitoring just like camera traps but um, uh, they can do better than camera traps in terms of recording broader range of animals uh, so basically any animal which makes sound can be recorded, uh, including small ones like insects, uh, frogs, uh, bats, um, ultrasounds uh, produced by bats can be recorded and so on. So it's not just uh, warm blooded, medium to large size mammals as with camera traps. And another advantage of acoustic monitoring compared to camera traps is what to get a photo on a camera trap, the animal has to be in front of the camera. If the animal passed just behind the tree on which the camera is, you will never know that. Uh, but with acoustic monitoring, uh, they record larger uh, sort of range um, and the animal doesn't have to be immediately in front of the recorder. It just has to be certain distance to be audible. Um, and with acoustic monitoring, you can use it in basically two ways. You can identify particular species which make particular sounds. And for some species, it's easy because they create very characteristic sounds. But also you can use this acoustic monitoring um, just to estimate overall biodiversity, just like you know many uh, instruments playing in orchestra. And then you hear the whole orchestra playing. Uh, if you are not um, an expert, uh, you might not be able maybe to identify all the musical instruments, but you can, can hear this whole sound of the orchestra. And obviously, the more instruments are playing, uh, the more species there are in the ecosystem, the more complete sound they make. So you can develop all kind of acoustic indices which will uh, be used as a measure of biodiversity, which will be able to predict species richness. So this is how uh, the data from acoustic recorder might look like. It's called spectrogram. So basically on x-axis we have time over which recording is taken, usually a few minutes. And on the y-axis we have a frequency. So this um, uh, spectrogram was taken from tropical rainforest in Asia. 
So at highest frequencies, ultrasound, we have bats. We cannot hear them. Uh, humans cannot hear them because it's beyond the, it's very high frequency. Uh, and then insects are a bit lower frequency, cicadas, for instance. Then we have lots of species of birds. And then the lowest sounds are made by orangutans. They have very low frequency calls. So you can see what this uh, spectrogram is quite busy in this tropical forest. Um, each acoustic niche, each frequency is occupied by some species. And what we can do is we can use um, sort of this information to study how different ways of habitat management affecting biodiversity. Because when we start to lose particular species, from ecosystem, uh, we will start to have some gaps and holes in this um, spectrogram. Uh, so some musical instruments in our orchestra will no longer be playing. Um, so uh, this is my other PhD student, Rich Beeson, who finished two years ago, and his PhD project was exactly looking at uh, using acoustic monitoring uh, to uh, uh, study forest biodiversity. So, for instance, he worked in Richmond Park and he looked at uh, how presence of invasive rhododendron in the habitat affected abundance and activity of bat species. Um, and then he recorded effects on bird species as well in, in other places. He built his own acoustic recorders um, what he used for recording. And these recorders could record both bats, ultrasounds, as well as birds. Uh, so they had uh, microphones and there was uh, uh, this um, uh, batteries which lasted for a few weeks. Uh, so let's try to play sounds. I hope it will work. Uh, let's see, tell me if you hear anything. So I'm going to play a few sounds made by different animals, and you try to guess what kind of animals they are. So let's try the first one. Can you hear it? Latsy, can you hear it? I can't hear you, Latsy. Can you hear me? Uh, uh, so you can hear the, the sounds, yeah? Yeah, it's an owl. Yeah, and uh, specifically, it's a towny owl. Yeah, good, good, good. Let's try another one. Any guesses? So this is okay. <laughs> no, no, th these are all. Sorry, I should have said these are all the animals in UK. So these are all UK animals. Well, no, not that. Uh, no, it sounds a little bit like a boar, but no, no. It's our biggest uh, mammal in UK. Oh, th th there are boars, uh, but it's not a boar. Yeah, it sounds a bit like a pig, but it's not. Yes, there are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In Forest of Dean, in, in some areas of Kent, there are arguments whether they are completely wild or not, but, uh, but, but yeah. A red deer, yeah, good, good. Yeah, so this is the stag, the male red deer. They make these sounds in autumn when they have rat, when they 
protect the harem of females from other males. All right, let's try another one. This is not a dog. It sounds like dog, but it's not. <laughs> OK. Uh, well, foxes do sometimes make a bit similar sounds, but this is not a fox, no. Uh, this is also a deer, but a different species. It's a roe deer, our smallest native deer. Uh, roe, roe deer. Yeah, they, they they sometimes called barking deer, so when they startled, they sometimes bark. OK, let's try some birds. Another very common bird. Blackbird, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and here is, here is Robin. <laughs> yeah, this one is Robin. So the blackbird is more fluty. Yeah. OK, good. Let's move on. So as I said, you can use this um, acoustic diversity uh, or as, as it's known also soundscape uh, assessment, assessment of sounds produced by the landscape as an indicator of habitat health. And this has been done um, in this famous um, recording from Lincoln Meadows in Sierra Nevada in California. Uh, there is a very famous, uh, famous wildlife uh, sound recorder, Bernie Krause, who used to be a musician before he started to recording sounds from nature. And that seems to be a very common path. Lots of former musicians are now doing uh, this acoustic uh, biodiversity monitoring. And so he lived in, in that area in California. And one year, a forestry company came. It was in 1980s. And they said what they want to do, selective logging of the forest nearby. So they would not just cut the forest completely. They will just remove individual trees. And they said, you know, it will be no noticeable impact. It will look still like a forest. Just individual trees will be removed. And we will be basically no effect on nature or biodiversity. And Bernie Krause asked them to record. So he went and recorded in this meadow before the uh, selective logging was done. And then he repeated the recording a year later. So this is what it looked like. Uh, this is uh, the spectrogram before the logging. Um, and you can see it's quite busy. There are lots of things happening here, lots of species. So let's hear how it sounds, how it sounded this uh, meadows before the logging. So you can hear there is a water on the background. There is like a little stream, but lots and lots of bird species. And then a year after, after the selective logging, you can already see on the spectrogram what there are. It's not as busy. The loss of species are gone. There is something over here in the middle. Let's hear what's going on.
So you can hear uh, water still very loudly, the stream, but very few birds, a little bit of woodpecker in the middle of this, this drumming sounds. Uh, so that was quite incredible because visually you couldn't see really much of the impact. The forest was still there, but apparently this selective logging still changed the habitat so significantly that um, it changed the biodiversity in the area. Uh, so this is Bernie Krause, and uh, he. this is a quote from him. So a great silence is spreading over the natural world, even as the sound of man is becoming deafening. So this acoustic monitoring is now used quite a lot to assess the sort of health of ecosystems um, and compare the impacts of different um, ways of managing ecosystems. And the good thing is what by using acoustic monitoring, you can uh, notice changes in ecosystems before they become uh, visually uh, observable. Uh, so hopefully you can then still interfere and change the management, start protecting these areas. So there are still challenges of passive acoustic monitoring. Uh, they, they do generate massive volume of data, so you need a lot of uh, sort of capacity to store them and process them. And to analyze the data, you need to have skills to do that. Uh, if you are after identification of sounds made by some groups of animals, it might be challenging. It's okay for bats. Uh, we have automatic um, identification uh, for most European bat species, but for many birds, it's still difficult. You have to do it sort of by listening. And obviously, still, even where acoustic monitoring is more inclusive than camera trapping, you monitor more species, but there are still species which don't make detectable sounds, and then obviously they will not be included in the recordings. Uh, and then, of course, ambient noise might be a problem. So you heard on that recording from Lincoln Meadows that there is a stream, so Rain, rain uh, wind might interfere with recording, acoustic recordings as well. And any anthropogenic noise, like if you're recording near the airport or near the motorway, uh, the sounds of animals might be muffled by the traffic sound. So to summarize, uh, these two methods, this camera trapping and passive acoustic monitoring, they uh, really improved our abilities to do non-invasive monitoring of changes in biodiversity in response to human impact. And they can be done over large areas and long periods of time. And these methods might allow detection of human impact on biodiversity in habitats which do not yet show any visual signs of deterioration. So sort of early signs, what something is wrong, what this habitat is declining, giving us still time to interfere and hopefully improve the situation. And finally, um, monitoring methods um, developing very quickly. So even during the sort of PhD study of my, uh, one of my PhD students, Rich Beeson, the availability of these acoustic recorders and what they can do and availability of programs to analyze the data changed dramatically just in a matter of few years. So biologists need to be tech savvy. So it's nice to just obviously just do simple things like uh, sweep netting and so on. But if you are good in DIY, if you, you know, not afraid of diving into a bit of more technological uh, devices, then um, you are, you have an advantage. All right. So that's, I think, my last slide. So I'll stop sharing my screen and I'm happy to take any questions. And I'm happy to see what we have more people than <laughs> when they turn into the full mod. So hopefully we haven't lost anybody. <laughs> but I do. Yes, I do. I've been there for 17 years. So I'm at the Department of Biology, uh, of Biological Sciences, same department as Latsi. So yeah, I'm a professor of ecology there. I do I do work at Royal Holloway. So now I should should be able to see chat as well.
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we have very diverse department. I mean, was a few who attended previous talks you could hear, you know, our biomedical colleagues, plant molecular scientists, ecologists. So, yeah, we we do all diversity of biological sciences, uh, all areas. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for those of you, especially those of you who have been active in the chat and taking guesses. It was good. Very good. Very good guesses. Yeah. Okay. Bye bye.
Thank you.
Thank you.